Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think that we've got about five minutes past nine, so I think that's a pretty good time to get going. Welcome here um, this morning to a panel called The Limits of Regulations, where we have a um, panel of three esteemed gentlemen that will explain to you all the pros and cons of what regulation means and doesn't mean, whether or not it can have impact on our personal freedoms and whether or not um, regulation can um, coexist with our comfortable lives or not, and to what extent it has played a role in what's been happening in the world economics in the past few years. The first speaker we have here is um, Robert Hahn, who's a director of economics at the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at Oxford University in the UK. Um, don't be fooled by his accent, because originally he's um, spent most of his academic life in the US, where he was the director Oh, sorry, he was a professor of economics at Manchester University, a senior fellow at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. He also served as the director of the AEI Brookings Joint Center. You may want to tell us a little bit what that is. Um, and previously, he also worked for the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Um, I think that that's plenty of introduction, Bob. If you could maybe add a little bit about yourself and then tell us your view on the limits of regulation in today's world. Thank you. You need to regulate me so I turn on the mic uh, appropriately. Good morning. Um, thank you, Hannah, for that kind introduction. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this event and particularly Professor Feiler, uh, not only for his good counsel on the academic side, but as a, a restaurant advisor, he's uh, unparalleled. Um, I also want to thank the students uh, who I met with yesterday, I had the privilege of meeting with, and uh, uh, I can tell you they're a most impressive uh, group of young people, and if you haven't had a chance, uh, you should meet with them and interact uh, with them. And I'd also like to thank uh, my host, uh, Kanifa Rasolova, for um, showing us the city and making sure that I get here on time uh, this morning. Uh, those of you who brave the rain and uh, um, actually made it here at 9 o'clock um, for a session entitled The Limits of Regulation uh, may be half as crazy as I am. So I'm going to uh, um, depart from my usual professorial style, which I will tell the graduate students about in a moment, uh, and present a different kind of presentation uh, about regulatory limits. Some time ago, I, uh, when I first started teaching at Carnegie Mellon uh, in my first semester, I got some very disappointing teacher ratings. So I went to teacher improvement school at the suggestion of uh, my boss, and I learned that the way to get good ratings was to state what you were going to do at the beginning of your lecture, to do it, and then highlight the three points at the end of the lecture that might be on the exam so students could get a good grade <laughs> on the exam. Well, I'm not going to do that today, uh, in part because I believe rules were made to be broken. And indeed, that's going to be one of my themes about the limits of uh, regulation. Instead, I'm going to offer you a tasting menu because I can't do justice to this subject in 20 minutes and also keep you awake. And from that set of examples that I'm going to present, we are going to try to off, uh, develop some generalizations about whether limits to regulation exist and what they might look like. But to begin with, why the question? Uh, what's so um, uh, important about regulation? Well, for those of you who live in the real world, which is to say at least not me, um, you, you must be keenly aware that regulation is a pervasive part of most uh, developed and even developing economies. Uh, it's been shown by economists uh, to have an important impact on the growth rate and sometimes the quality of life. So you might be interested in its limits for that reason. Another reason, based on casual empiricism going back more than a thousand years, is that most uh, civilized societies and developed societies have used uh, 
regulations in a number of areas, um, including great societies in Mesopotamia, Rome, Greece, India, China, um, just to mention uh, a few. Let me see if I can uh, get this thing to work. Okay, yes, I'm from Oxford. Okay, so we're going to ask the question, are there any limits to regulation? And we're going to try to answer it through examples using an old theorem that I learned in economics that the plural of anecdotes is fact. So we're going to try to develop a, a, a couple of facts based on these illustrations. Um, my first uh, um, example has to do with uh, something that um, many of you might have had for breakfast this morning, and that's, that's bread. Uh, you may or may not know in, that in the year 1266, uh, King Henry III decided that it would be a good idea to regulate not only the price of bread, but also the composition of bread. Um, you might also uh, be aware that the good people in uh, England uh, continued with some form of bread regulation for about 600 years. Years. Um, not to be outdone, uh, their counterparts, I guess, across the strait or ocean or whatever, the French, uh, as you probably know, had bread riots and uh, people were killed at some point. Bakers were um, uh, um, actually persecuted if they charged a price for bread that was in excess of what economists might call uh, marginal cost. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, the good news is French economists, um, uh, when they saw a regulatory limit that they did not think made a lot of sense, uh, they suggested that you might want to repeal um, these uh, um, uh, essentially um, uh, price ceilings on bread. And uh, I'm happy to report that not so long ago, in 1981, the French actually removed, uh, at least according to Wikipedia, they removed their last price control on bread, which was uh, on the price of a baguette. So that gives you um, some sense of uh, really two things. Um, one, which you obviously know, if you, if you set a price ceiling on something, you'll have frequently have another way of rationing that good, which is in the form of uh, lines or what uh, they call cues in the United uh, Kingdom. And at the same time, regulation can serve the, the, the needs of uh, politicians and uh, may also um, have very different characteristics from a market-based solution. Uh, my next example is closer to um, my home and uh, those of you with a little gray hair may have heard of something called prohibition. How many people don't know what prohibition is in this room? You can raise your hand. Great. Okay, so that means we don't have too many teetotalers here. Uh, prohibition occurred in the United States around 1920 where um, alcohol was effectively uh, prohibited. It was driven uh, by, among other things, the temperance movement uh, for those mothers who thought that it would not be a good idea for their soldier sons or daughters to be imbibing alcohol. Um, it was enforced as you can see uh, in this picture, um, using a, ra a rather low-tech approach, but the point I want to get across here is it wasn't enforced uh, with great, as they say in Boston, vigor. Um, uh, in fact, if you went to New York around 1925, you would find on the order of about 50,000 speakeasies. Does anyone know what a speakeasy is? A speakeasy was you sort of knocked on the door, but you had to know the secret handshake. It was kind of like being at Oxford. You really can't get into the place unless you know the secret handshake or the, what we would call today the password. And so they had these speakeasies as a workaround for this alcoholic, uh, for this prohibition on alcohol. Later in the 1920s, about 1929, there was something called the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Anybody heard of that? Okay, Professor Filer's heard of all this stuff, but okay. 
So the St. Valentine's Day Massacre featured none other than Al Capone from the north side of Chicago and uh, uh, from the south side, I think it was the Irish Bugs Moran, uh, going at it with their machine guns and it made for great theater and uh, there were a couple of movies about it. But it really, for my purposes here, it really changed people's views of whether prohibition was a good thing or a bad thing. And indeed, um, oops, uh, there were people, uh, there was another interest group that you can see here, which reflects more uh, my buddies at Oxford who I head down to the pub with around six o'clock, saying we're kind of tired of this stuff, we like some beer, and in fact, they actually got it uh, legitimized again um, in 1933. So what can we learn from, uh, from this exercise in prohibition? Um, First of all, as you might expect, it raised the cost of drinking so much, the effect uh, somewhat. It raised the cost of drinking as you raise the, the cost or the price of something. Um, consumption went down. It was also associated with organized crime getting in on the act because they thought, saw that there were profits to be made by um, uh, developing and um, restricting who could own these speakeasies. Next example uh, is um, a little bit closer to today and has to do with something called speed limits. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm purposely not specifying units in this picture, um, but to an American, you'd think of the speed as 100 miles per hour, which except on the Autobahn is a reasonably fast speed. And you could have a speed limit like that, and it wouldn't do much to put a dent in the 30,000 fatalities that are experienced on roadways in the United States in a given year. You could also dramatically drop the speed limit to something only an academic could love <laughs> and have about the same impact on fatalities because no one would know what that speed limit meant. <laughs> and if you were wearing a bulletproof vest, you might suggest we have some random number, like a speed limit, like four miles per hour, which you could imagine, if enforced, could make a serious dent in the number of fatalities, uh, but may not be politically uh, feasible. So what can we learn uh, from this example? There are important trade-offs that regulators and politicians, as we saw in the previous example, will need to make, and it underscores the limits of regulation uh, again. We can think of um, uh, having no effective speed limit, or what is close to no effective speed limit, like 100 miles per hour, or we could go to the other extreme. We have choices there, and they're going to be dictated by different kinds of political limits, economic restrictions, and technological constraints, a theme that I will return to. One or two more examples. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Professor Stiglitz talked about it last night. Um, there are a whole host of suggestions that have been made to deal with the financial crisis or um, what Professor Posner likes to call the depression that we're now in. One of them is increasing reserve requirements at banks. Suffice it to note that there are many different kinds of places that you can put your money. For example, I put a lot of my money uh, into something called the Money Market Fund in the United States, which feels and looks a lot like a bank to me. I keep it there, I think it's pretty safe, but actually doesn't have the same legal status as a commercial bank. So one of the problems in setting up regulations where you're restricting your attention to some subset of commercial activity, like banks versus non-banks, is that you may only be regulating part of the picture, and there can be leakage from one part to another part. And all I want to say here now is one wants to take that account, take that into account in thinking about many kinds of regulation, including financial regulation. So if we add an objective of uh, keeping the, system, the financial system relatively safe and economic growth, we're going to want as economists and also public policy makers to think about the kinds of trade-offs involved. 
We, all, we are also, as Professor Stiglitz pointed out, going to want to think hard about what, what economists sometimes call externalities or the risks that an individual bank's behavior or an, or an individual might impose on the broader system at large. In this case, the, what is sometimes called systemic risk, that you can bring the whole system down and may become, uh, in some sense, unstable. So this, um, uh, th this particular policy that I've identified here of increasing reserve requirements, when you have a leaky system, either because you have different rules across countries or you're only regulating part of the system within a country, you need to think about those limits when you're regulating. Another example from a completely different area, and my last anecdote, if you'll bear with me, is from climate change and trying to regulate climate change. Now this is a rather peculiar graph and it really has to do with um, the US emissions of carbon dioxide over time. Uh, which you can see are gradually going up on this graph from, I guess, about 1980 to the present. And the point is we have a lot of political, um, uh, what I might call um, goodwill or, or statesmanship, suggesting that climate change is a serious problem. And I could go back even further to President Bush 1. But, but President Clinton says we simply must halt global warming. Uh, we have something called the Kyoto Protocol which most of you in this room I'm sure are familiar with and, and uh, the EU signed on to, but the US did not in 1997. And then we have uh, statements from successive presidents of different political persuasions saying we have to deal with it. From uh, uh, an academic economist's point of view, most of this is cheap talk or to use a bad metaphor, hot air in the context of uh, climate change. Not because these are necessarily bad uh, uh, people or um, don't mean what they say, but there's serious problems in trying to deal with a global public good or a global public bad like greenhouse gas emissions which lead to uh, climate change. So even if you're sitting in the EU and reduce your emissions to zero, if the emissions of the developing world continue going up and the emissions of China going up, you may not make a big dent on the problem. And even if you agree with China and some other big countries to engage in an agreement, call it the Kyoto Protocol or the son of the Kyoto Protocol, there may be very serious problems with actually monitoring and enforcing an agreement like this. So what economists call free rider problems. Uh, um, so I point this out to suggest another way of thinking about limitations to regulation. Let me wrap up now. So the first point uh, um, for those of you taking my regulation course or not wanting to take my regulation course but wanting takeaways, as they say in the UK, um, is that regulation is hard to do in many contexts. And you want to think about that, that there are serious limits in what you can do to change people's behavior and business behavior. The next point is that regulation may not always achieve your desired objective. If you prohibit the consumption of alcohol or you set a speed limit of four miles per hour, um, there may be political rev revolts or interest groups that aren't necessarily going to adhere to that and the cost of enforcing it may be prohibitive. Regulation uh, also can have uh, other intent unintended or sometimes even intended arguably uh, side effects. So that's my conclusion and now let me try to answer the question that Professor Filer posed to me about uh, a month ago. Uh, does regulation have limits? Absolutely. That's the bottom line for the exam. They're imposed in a number of ways. Um, first of all, by available methods for monitoring and enforcement. That's going to put a constraint on what governments might be able to do. Um, Simply, sim simple economics is going to put a constraint, may, may be very expensive, uh, even in this day and age of high tech, uh, um, to impose different kinds of regulations. And politicians, uh, particularly those in democracies, are naturally going to re be receptive to the interests of groups uh, 
whether it be mothers who don't want their children to drink or whatever, and are going to take that into account in the way they both uh, design laws and um, subsequently the regulations, uh, they implement the regulations that flow from them. So let me stop there and thank you for listening. Thank you, Bob, for a very interesting introduction into our discussion today and also for being on time. That rarely happens at these events. Um, I will now pass the floor on to um, our other distinguished guest, Hassan Sis. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Okay. Okay, very good. It's good to know. Hassan is a Deputy General Counsel Knowledge and Research from the World Bank and Senegal. Um, and you represent here, obviously, the regulatory side of the power here um, because obviously we have the academy we have just heard um, and you previously also besides the World Bank worked for the IMF another big regulatory institution in this world um, you've also worked for the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council the rule of law and um, you've wrote a number of um, papers in the matter um, so the floor is yours now tell me your perspective from the world of the regulators thank you very much for the kind introduction um, I'm delighted to be to be here in this uh, uh, very august uh, institution and on this panel. Um, I would like to reflect on the issue of uh, regulation from the perspective of a development agency, uh, which is uh, which is the World Bank. Um, and I would like to focus on uh, the three questions that have been asked by the organizers of this uh, of this panel. One. How do we balance necessary regulation with individual liberty and freedom? Uh, what are the limits of national sovereignty in a world where regulation coordination is necessary? And three, how can international organization and governance structures deal with global problems while achieving international harmony? Um, but before getting into trying to, to respond uh, to, to the, the questions that have been asked here, I would like to go into the purpose of regulation itself uh, from our perspective as a development institution. Um, for us, uh, the purpose of regulation is to support the goals of um, sustainable, inclusive, and equitable development. Um, and this suggests uh, the question of appropriate reg regulation this also suggests the question of what kind of regulation uh, has to be in place. So um, by and large, um, I would like to come back here to a point that was made yesterday by Professor Stiglitz when he talked about regulation and he said that uh, the, you have to ask yourself first what kind of regulation and uh, you know after you, you ask the kind of regulation, you get into the, the effect, effectiveness of the regulations in question. So I would like to come back to, to all of these issues. But uh, uh, suffice it to say that from our perspective, uh, we as World Bank work on um, helping countries put in place regulations that are ad adequate to their environment, that are also effective to achieve the goals of sustainability, inclusion, and equity in growth and development. So first, therefore, let me talk a bit about the question of uh, balancing necessary regulation with individual liberty and freedom. Um, as you know, individual liberty and freedom operate within and are framed by institutions. In the context of economic growth, which is the focus of our work as, um, as the bank, um, the main issue is, when you talk about regulation, is ultimately the role that you give this to the state uh, in, uh, in the economy. And here I would like to say a bit about uh, uh, what has been called the Washington Consensus, which as you know throughout the 90s was what um, was basically the, the intellectual framework uh, that was uh, at the root of many of uh, the policy prescriptions uh, that were put forward by the Bretton Woods institutions and many other development agencies. And uh, basically, when you look at the Washington Consensus, uh, it reflects a view 
about the role of the state and the role of regulation. Um, to a large extent, many of the prescriptions were uh, about uh, you know, reducing the role of the state, about more privatization and the like. All of you are, are very familiar with that. But what is interesting is that um, recently, um, our institutions have been shying away uh, from uh, those policy prescriptions. Uh, the gross report that was uh, uh, published in uh, 2005 um, basically concluded that many of the policy prescriptions that were uh, 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 put forward under the Washington Consensus have not succeeded, at least not as expected. And therefore, we are now in a new situation where when it comes to this issue of whether you should have more regulation, less regulation, more state, less state, I mean, there is almost an ideological vacuum that uh, we are dealing with. Um, w one, one thing that you see now repeated often in the many of our uh, reports, most recently in the World Development Report uh, put together by the bank um, on conflict and fragility, uh, one of the main conclusions was something relatively simple <laughs> that maybe one would say we should have known a long time ago, uh, which, which is just that one size does not fit all. And in the past, uh, we have been criticized for uh, uh, having something that looked like a one size should, should fit all. Um, so uh, that is the, the first point. The second point um, uh, tries to answer the question about uh, the limits of national sovereignty in a world where regulatory coordination is, uh, is necessary. As you know, the consequences of uh, the worldwide financial crisis uh, cannot be addressed effectively by isolated national regulatory and administrative, uh, and administrative measures. Um, so what, what does it mean concretely? It means that um, you need to have regulatory coordination at, um, at, the, international, uh, at the international level. Um, how does regulatory coordination uh, work at the international level? Here, um, one has maybe to also look at um, how what I would call traditional international uh, bodies like the IMF, the World Bank, WTO, and other, organi other organizations that were created by treaty are actually, in a sense, uh, losing, um, uh, losing uh, the, the role that uh, was initially ascribed to them in terms of uh, um, uh, steering uh, the rules in the international community, and then you have the emergence of uh, other types of uh, networks um, that are more informal, informal in intergovernmental net networks or cooperation. You can think of the G G20. If today uh, there is a crisis, I think that uh, before turning to our types of institutions, people are thinking first of, okay, what is the G20 saying about these things? And these informal network are, uh, in a sense, orienting uh, the policies, um, at least at the economic level, in, uh, in the international arena. That does not mean that uh, institutions like the Bretton Woods institutions and others uh, do not have um, a role. Their role may still be important, but uh, this is a new trend that shows that uh, uh, the effectiveness of regulation uh, is not necessarily linked to the way the institution that is issuing a regulation is, uh, is established, but that you can have informal network that can come up with regulation that can actually uh, be much more effective in the way uh, the, the recipients of the regulations are, are uh, responding to them. And finally, very briefly, the third question that was asked by the, the organizers is how international organizations and governance structures deal with global problems while achieving international harmony. And there, the first, maybe the first uh, uh, answer is uh, uh, about enhancing the accountability of these international organizations uh, uh, in uh, dealing with global problems. Um, to enhance the, the, the accountability of these organizations, uh, 
Uh, three elements are important. One is participation, the other is transparency, and uh, the last one is uh, accountability. Um, and all this is linked again to the issue that uh, we are dealing with here, which is regulation. Uh, the entity that, is, uh, that, is, that has the regulatory power in order to be effective needs to have legitimacy. And in order to have legitimacy, these issues of participation, transparency, and accountability are extremely important. Um, so when you look at how we have been evolving uh, over the, the, the past 10 years, you, you are looking at institutions that were created after World War II um, that uh, reflected uh, the power structures that were in place after World War II, but the world has changed in, a, in, a, in an amazing way you have new power that have emerged. Uh, you have interests that are very divergent from maybe those ones that were uh, put forward after, after World War II. And therefore, for these institutions to remain relevant and um, accepted, they need to reflect the interests and the new power structures. And that this is uh, seen in uh, the way the institutions like the IMF and the World Bank are trying to deal with their governance structures to sort of update them to reflect the, the new distribution of power uh, uh, around the world. We have also many other mechanisms, I don't want to get into the details, uh, that uh, uh, help with accountability. So a few comments about uh, the way forward. Um, we, we do believe in the World Bank that uh, you know, the principle that no size uh, the one size does not fit all is something that uh, we have to deepen. It means that uh, we need to be much more humble in approaching many uh, challenges in the countries that uh, we are working on. Uh, we need to refine the analytical tool, economic or otherwise, that we have in order to have a very fine understanding of different situations in order to be able to uh, come up with policy uh, policy suggestions for policy makers in, 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 the, in the countries. Um, I also would like to say something here about, uh, and because this is the theme of the conference, about the rule of law, rule of law and democracy is the theme of the conference, and uh, echo a little bit some of the issues that were raised by um, uh, Professor Stiglitz yesterday, um, that the rule of, rule of law uh, encompasses um, policy making, institutional framework, international politics and, and development. And therefore, it is important uh, to bring the, the dimension of a rule of law in policy making and also in uh, regulatory approaches that, uh, and there maybe my, my, my colleague economist, uh, this is our traditional fight. We want to bring um, a certain dimension um, uh, that is related to justice, equity, and the like in uh, the policy prescriptions that are, uh, that are being put forward. So as lawyers, we feel that uh, uh, that dimension is not always apparent in uh, some economic prescriptions that are, uh, that are made. And finally, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, we in, uh, in the bank, the legal community in the bank, is trying to develop actually a uh, a platform for bringing to the fore in international policy making uh, this legal dimension that has to do with uh, uh, justice, equity, and the like uh, as part of the international discourse uh, regarding development, as part of also the analytical, analytical framework that, uh, uh, that is uh, relevant in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll now pass the floor to our third speaker, Mr. Zdeněk Duma, whom those of you who are from the Czech Republic probably know quite well. He worked as the head of the Czech National Bank for many years, and um, since then has gone back to private sector that he originally came from when he worked as the economist from Patria Finance. Um, throughout his career, he also worked for other regulatory-like institutions. He worked for the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and worked in many different institutions. I think if I were to list them all, we'd be here still in the afternoon. <laughs> Anyways, um, so to the limits of regulation, um, Stenik, if you could tell us your view of the matter and the question. 
Uh, I thank you, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me start with the answer to the question whether there are limits uh, to the regulation. Yes, I think uh, they are. And let me add some examples from my experience from the Czech National Bank, because as you probably know, the Czech National Bank is uh, responsible also for the supervision of the financial sector. Uh, my first point uh, regards uh, uh, the question whether the, res the response by the authorities uh, at the beginning of the crisis uh, was appropriate in the sense that the authorities came very quickly to the conclusion that there, that there was something wrong with the rules and with the regulation. It was argued that the regulation was inappropriate and that we need uh, more or it is a uh, smarter regulation. Uh, in my opinion, uh, we haven't done uh, sufficient analysis because relatively shortly before the crisis, uh, the new uh, type of regulation, the Basel II in the banking sector was introduced and we didn't have much experience. The fact that the regulation in, uh, in the financial sector is typically pro cyclical this, seems, this, was, uh, this is nothing new. And, uh, you know, in the end, until today, it has not been resolved and I'm very doubtful that it will be resolved. Uh, so this is, this is uh, the, the question whether uh, we uh, failed in terms of the enforcement of the rules which were not so bad or whether the rules were really so bad. So I, my, you know, I, I'm closer to the position uh, that uh, the enforcement was, was the problem, especially in some countries and not all countries, uh, not all supervisors fails. Uh, 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 in the same uh, in the same scale, it leads me to uh, the second point that uh, first of all we must understand the risk, and the rules cannot help us to understand the risk. I remember many discussions in the international fora in the past, and there were people like the Bill White, the chief economist from the BIS, who uh, uh, were suggesting that we should open the discussion about the, uh, the financial sector development and that there are some risk involved. But most discussions uh, led to the conclusion that, uh, for instance, the securitization uh, led to more diversification in the financial sector. So that despite some problems, it's understand the, the risk, it's, it was very likely that it uh, led to more robust financial sector. So it was a wrong conclusion, a wrong understanding of the risk. And uh, it, uh, you know, that misunderstanding uh, differed at level of companies and also at level of individual uh, supervisors. I remember one discussion with, uh, uh, with uh, one uh, senior representative of uh, uh, one global financial institution and he said, well, we realized that uh, we stop understanding the risk of some financial products so that we ask our traders to slow down. But it wasn't the case in uh, all institutions, so that's why some institutions uh, had more troubles. And um, because we can argue in a similar way um, regarding, uh, regarding supervisors in some countries, some countries had more troubles than uh, others. Uh, so the point is that uh, the rules don't help to understand the risk and first of all we should understand the risk. So the major problem was misunderstanding or uh, misjudge, misjudgment as, and misunderstanding the risk in the, in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, the third point is the, that uh, with the new regulation, uh, despite I think that's, that's questionable, uh, but it may happen that the banking sector or the financial sector will become safer but it will be at the cost that uh, it will be less, less attractive for in investors and uh, or, or uh, uh, will be uh, more expensive for, uh, for clients. Uh, so it's uh, in line with uh, those uh, historical parallel because we, uh, we saw uh, this in the past uh, many times. And uh, the fourth point, uh, when the authorities uh, mm, uh, apply more regulation, uh, so then they take also more responsibility because then uh, people would expect more and they would rely much more on the authorities and because they would say, okay, you, you regulate, you are responsible for uh, the, the, this type of market, the financial market is safe and it's your responsibility and if there is a problem, I would sue you. Uh, so this is also the quite uh, obvious implication.
But my last point is that uh, uh, the new regulation also creates opportunities, for instance, for consultancy companies where I work at this moment. So that for me, it's a dilemma whether I should criticize the new regulation so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stenik. I couldn't help myself remember when back in the days when you were working for the Czech National Bank and the Czech Republic had its own version of the financial crisis when one of the banks um, operating here were running out of money to finance the big, you know, uh, the big enterprises. And um, it was a difficult time for the sector. And if I remember correctly, I was a journalist back in those days, um, you as your institution reacted by actually introducing more strict regimes for the banks. You were trying to keep them under control, make them create more reserves, which created obviously a lot of political discussions and there was a lot of tension, but effectively, in retrospect, it actually helped the sector and it made the sector healthier and stronger to face, for example, the current global economic crisis, isn't that the case? Uh, right, but it was a quite different situation at the beginning of the 90s because we started from scratch and at that time, uh, we didn't have practically uh, any regulation at that time. Uh, uh, and we cannot pretend that there were people in the central bank who uh, understood how to uh, supervise financial markets uh, because we didn't have any experience with that. Moreover, people in financial markets, they also didn't have any experience. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a mess from the very beginning. So very in inappropriate regulation and very low competence at the, uh, on the side of the supervisor, but also on the side of the financial market. So it, uh, it led to uh, two problems uh, relatively quickly in the first half of the 90s. Uh, uh, the, you know, um, f first it was visible in, in smaller and medium-sized medium banks. So that's why uh, the Czech National Bank uh, responded uh, and acted primarily in, in that sector. And uh, in the end of the 90s, uh, it, um, it, it was resolving the situation in bigger uh, institutions. The advantage of, uh, of this relatively small financial sector was that uh, you could resolve that uh, through the privatization uh, or uh, uh, takeover uh, by foreign companies. So in the end, like many other countries uh, in the Central and Eastern Europe, uh, due to very similar problems, uh, uh, financial sectors ended up in, in hands of uh, foreign institutions. So. In other words, when we needed the capital, it was uh, where to go. But this is the problem today, <laughs> that it's very difficult to raise more capital globally. So it was a relatively easy solution, uh, it means, to uh, come up with uh, a standard regulation uh, and to increase the competence uh, both on the side of uh, uh, supervisory authorities and the financial sector and it was relatively easy to raise the capital in abroad. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to sort of take the floor now to back to the international scene a little bit, and I wanted to ask the panelists um, basically two questions related to what's currently happening in the world. One question would be, was insufficient regulation at fault for all the different economic issues that the big um, economies are facing now, both the US, the European economy, and globally. Did we not have enough regulators who knew enough about what collateralized debt obligations are, etc.? And was this the reason why, or at least one of the reasons why we've had the problems we're facing now? And the second question, are we going to have more regulation as a result of this going forward? Will the world be tighter as, as a consequence? We will have regulatory frameworks and regulatory rules for basically a, a, for every basic activity that a bank or a company is going to do. So these two questions, I don't know who wants to start. Uh, maybe Bob, you will go. Uh, really simple questions, thank you. Um, let me take them in reverse order, which reflects my degree of confidence about my answers. Are we going to have tighter regulation or more regulation, undoubtedly. Um, will that regulation uh, tend to look back um, and uh, in, in, in the vernacular 
inclined more towards fighting the last war as opposed to thinking about the kind of system that we want a decade or two down the road, uh, undoubtedly just based on my uh, observations of regulatory processes, at least in the United States. Um, what caused the financial meltdown, getting to question one, and uh, to what extent was um, uh, lack, of it, lack of regulation? Um, I think that's a much tougher one, and that chapter hasn't been written definitively yet. Uh, you commented uh, on it a little bit in your remarks. Um, my own view is that um, part of it uh, was an absence of understanding or expertise on the part of the regulator, re regulators. That doesn't, that I wouldn't use the word insufficient regulation, but I would say there was some kind of regulatory failure. I am deeply concerned, speaking from the perspective of the United States, which is what I know a little bit about, um, about attempts at quick fixes to this problem, like those contained in the, the more than 1,000 page Dodd-Frank Dodd bill. But um, uh, I think that in the broadest sense, I would feel, I'm being careful here, but in the broadest sense, I would feel comfortable saying that you could lay part of the blame for what you're calling the financial meltdown at the steps of regulation, but, but, you know, but the details have yet to be worked out by good academics. Thank you very much, Bob. Hassan, you take it on. Thank you. Um, what was the cause of, um, uh, of the crisis? So was it due to insufficient regulation? Um, again, I think that uh, for the next 10 years, people will be writing a lot about uh, what triggered it. Um, in, my, in my view, um, this may not just be limited to um, the absence of adequate regulations in, 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 in some cases, but also how regulations were being enforced. And um, uh, drawing a bit uh, on my uh, experience as, as an attorney, um, what happens very often is that you can have uh, regulations in the books, but um, in terms of being enf enforcing them, um, the people who are supposed to say, to draw the lines, may be under tremendous pressure sometimes, you know, to even come up with a creative way of doing things. And um, I think that that creativeness, creativity is, 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 always a, is always good, but in some cases, um, too much creativity can lead <laughs> to some major, major issues. And um, I believe that there was um, some euphoria uh, in the system, especially in the United States for some time. And um, you know, maybe many regulators um, either under pressure looked the other way or uh, you know, just did not enforce the rule the way uh, they were supposed to, to enforce them. So I think that it is part of the equation. Uh, whether, they were, whether all the rules were okay was also, you know, uh, uh, was also another aspect of, uh, of the problem. Um, are we going to have more rules I, I do believe, like Professor Hahn, that uh, we will have more rules because very often uh, the way policymakers tend to respond to crisis is generally to go to, you know, very far to the other side of the spectrum. And um, so I would not be surprised if uh, in, in the coming months and years in many different parts of the world you'll see more regulations until unfortunately the next crisis comes. and. Uh, before you realize, people will say, oh, regulations are bad. Let's go back to a situation where you don't have too many regulations. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, I think it, it brings us back to uh, some of the issues that Professor Stiglitz raised yesterday, which is the really the appropriate level of regulation and the appropriate level of enforcement. And it looks like it's almost an art to figure out that, uh, uh, that, that point. <laughs>
Uh, well, uh, certainly, uh, even at this moment, uh, the regulation is stricter than it was before the crisis, and uh, it uh, continues, so it's uh, the continuing wave of uh, regulation. But it leads me to the question whether uh, the stricter regulation or regulation itself can uh, help uh, to deal with the risk. Um, in my opinion, you don't need rules to understand and to deal with the risk. It's your responsibility being uh, the manager of, uh, of a company. Uh, perhaps there's um, the is a, a more important role uh, of the rules, and this is that there are the same uh, rules for everybody, so there's the same uh, playing field in the financial market, because all managers are responsible for managing the risk in their companies, uh, but to uh, prevent uh, the arbitrage uh, in the financial market, so this is another very important aspect of the rules uh, that uh, it, it would uh, be applied uh, to everybody in the same way. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, there will be uh, stricter, uh, stricter rules, uh, more difficult uh, world, and it's enormous uncertainty at this moment because it's very difficult to predict how the financial market will be influenced uh, and how it will operate in the future because some proposals like uh, net stable funding ratio will influence uh, uh, the way how, uh, how, for instance, banks operate. Thank you very much, um, all panelists. I, I must say you leaving me a little bit worried because I, I do fear that the world with more regulation is, is not going to be so much fun. Um, in the, to say it in the simple words, I, I think that we're getting to the stage where there will be restrictions on, on businesses, there will be restrictions of what banks want to do, there will be restrictions um, on our lives, um, as, as is posed in the question of, of number one on this panel. Um, but what, what also s strikes me as a little bit scary in this process of tightening regulation is that there will be a shift of power towards the regulators, which are often um, closely tied with politicians so more power will be directed towards um, the state, towards various regulatory institutions, and less will be left for the market and for the companies. And having been a journalist for a long time, and even in my current job, I've seen a lot of abuses of this power when we have a lot, a lot of power concentrated in the hands of few regulators or few politicians. Um, they abuse it. It happens everywhere, and I'm sure you in your experience in the World Bank or Eustinac have seen it. Isn't that a big risk that we're taking on to shift more power towards the hands of the selected few being regulators, being politicians? Um, actually, sorry, I should say, if you could all respond or whichever one of you want to respond first. Yes, if I may, may comment on, on that. Um, to me, really, um, the issue is, um, is not whether you have um, more regulation or less regulation, but what kind of regulation do you have? Are they adequate to address the specific risks that have been identified? And what kind of enforcement tools do you put in place to ensure that the regulations are targeting the risks in question? And so, to me, ultimately, the issue is the type of smart rules that are going to be put in place. In the immediate, um, I believe that policymakers are responding to you know, the outcry. Um, look at what is happening in the United States, in Spain, and some other countries where people are out in the streets saying, okay, when you let the market forces you know, do their things, look at what happened. So if, for example, the movement that you see in the US gets bigger and bigger, policymakers are bound to respond. And uh, in the response, sometimes the response can go too far one way or another. Um, one could uh, say, uh, on, the, on the part of people who are uh, um, protesting today in the streets, they are saying um, there was not enough regulation, so market forces um, took decisions 
that are affecting a majority of the people, and that was unfair. So that is what people in the street are saying. Um, and their answer is just, you know, government should come in and fix this. And the, but the point that you are raising is as valid, which is, you know, are you sure that government, when it is, you know, apply, uh, uh, enacting new regulations and the like, is doing it also, you know, based on objective standards and all those kind of things, whether there will not be abuses, um, the risks are there. So again, that comes back to what my colleague raised about the risks that you are trying to take, uh, to, 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 to fix. You know, the risks can be on the part of market forces, and they have to be adequately addressed. Risk also could be on the part of the regulators, and they have to be adequately fixed, and therefore, it argues, I think, for smart regulations and smart enforcement. Uh, well, in my opinion, uh, regulators and supervisors were powerful uh, quite a lot uh, even before the crisis. Uh, so I don't think that they would have uh, more powers because even in the past they, they could uh, decide on on the fate of uh, almost any institution in the financial market, uh, but uh, what I, uh, what I, where I'm a bit concerned is that there is much more politics involved, uh, and uh, as, as you have said, uh, that it's a response to the outcry uh, uh, in the in the general public. Uh, when you compare the discussion about the Basel II, uh, so that uh, framework was uh, developed for many years, discussed at the expert level. In, in Basel, and uh, then there were uh, long discussions about the implementation. Uh, comparing with the Basel III, it was prepared very quickly and it was asked to uh, implement it as fast as possible. And the major difference is that uh, it was uh, asked that, that, that change or uh, those new regulations were uh, asked by politicians. So. It's uh, those informal networks like G7 or G20, but I don't think that this is the, uh, the, the appropriate platform for uh, shaping uh, the regulation. It, would, it, it should uh, uh, remain much more at the expert level. So from my point of view, it's not so much about whether supervisors would have more power because they are and they were sufficiently powerful, but uh, today more politics is involved and this is uh, not uh, this is not something I, I'm glad to see. <laughs> I'm gonna, being an academic, I have the privilege of responding orthogonally to any question you ask, which means uh, in a weird way. Um, I want to start by just by making it clear, and I think Joe Stiglitz made it clear last night, that there is what we ha call an externality here. Um, the actions of an AIG or a big bank or some other big firm have the potential, even in the best of worlds, to bring down the system, particularly if left completely unregulated. So there's a rationale for regulation. It would be nice in an idealized world if we had smart or smarter regulation. So I think most people I know agree on that framework. What I think is really important with respect to this problem that I fear is not going to happen is that we step back as academics, those graduate students in the room have a real opportunity here, and ask what really drove us uh, in a way to this unfortunate outcome where in some sense the system came down. Now we have been focusing, partly because of the topic of this uh, session today, on regulation, but there are other potential culprits. For example, maybe monetary policy in the United States uh, might have been too loose. So I think it's really important in asking ourselves the broad question, what went wrong, to cast a broad net, try to learn, what actually went wrong, and then come up with a judicious uh, set of responses. And I fear, as I think most of my colleagues on the panel, that politicians may overreact, but that's just the natural order of things in a democracy and uh, one of its strengths as well as one of its weaknesses. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. I, yeah, it is, it's unfortunate. Obviously, we we're talking about regulation as being one of the faults of what's been going on uh, globally, but I think that's mainly because this is the panel, this is the topic of our panel, and surely I don't mean to say that um, that's the only reason why the world is where it is right now because it's been over regulated. Um, so going forward, um, what would you recommend to the regulators of this world? Um, we've heard a lot on that issue from Hassan in the sense of um, let's try to go for appropriate like uh, regulation that's efficient, that um, applies the rules and functions well. It sounds, it sounds very wise. Can you elaborate on that? How would you see the uh, appropriate amount of regulation that the world should have in order to function better? If um, I can ask all three of you. Yes. Um, again, I'm, I'm coming uh, from the perspective of an institution that uh, for many, many years has been giving advice uh, to countries. And uh, an institution that has been criticized also for having given uh, at times the wrong advice. An institution that has been criticized for having given advice uh, that were ideologically based. Um, recently, during our annual meetings, uh, the president of the World Bank, President Zelik, uh, made uh, a, a very important speech uh, that was called Beyond Aid, which was right before the annual meetings. And uh, um, uh, he came up with, um, he talked about tectonic shifts that are taking place uh, in the international scene and called really for a new paradigm of thinking and doing. And um, if you apply that to what we are talking about here, um, which is what do we do, I think that the situation calls for doing things in a way that is radically different from the way we have been approaching many issues uh, in, uh, in the international uh, arena. Um, for the longest time, uh, the way issues were resolved was uh, based on ideology. And I think that uh, it is very clear that uh, ideology was a rudimentary framework for helping solve the problem facing countries and facing our world today. So if you put ideology aside, I think that uh, 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 the situation calls for a smarter approach um, that uh, takes into account uh, the complexity of the situations that we have. I think that when uh, the solutions were ideologic ideologically based, uh, what was happening was that one would analyze a situation uh, based on specific lenses, and the lenses would give you a set of answers. Um, when you accept that a situation is extremely complex and uh, has a, a variety of factors that are political, economic, cultural, you name it, and one uh, tries uh, to, to look at them in their diversity and complexity and try and develop um, um, an analytical framework that is adequate, I think that uh, one could, with uh, humility, and some patience too, because one would not uh, succeed at the first try. But with humility and patience, one can come up with um, uh, solutions, including rules, that are appropriate to the situation at hand. And the rules, and that to me that is the important part, the rules do not need to be the same uh, in different circumstances. The rules would have to be adjusted based on the circumstances that uh, one would have uh, at hand. I, I know it's a, it's a long answer, but I do believe that uh, it reflects the complexity of what we are facing and the need for having new approaches, because many of the old approaches seem to have failed. Just to elaborate on that, but where would this new initiative come from? Who would create these new rules? Who would write them? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very difficult yes, she's tough, yes. That is a very difficult question to, to answer. But what I believe, again, uh, coming back to the complexity of the situation that we have, is we have a multiplicity of actors. And the simplicity that we were used to in the past, you know, you just say, okay, this group of central bankers, you know, 
you guys can come up with some rules. Oh, you guys IMF, you guys World Bank. I mean, that was the simple world. The world has become much more complex. And maybe uh, the new formula has not yet been created. As we speak, maybe it is being created. Hence the difficulty of answering your question and saying, you know, this one or that one is going to, 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 to give the answer. Because it is happening as, uh, as we speak. Thank you. Rob Staniak, Well, I want to build a little bit on some of the points that you made, Hassan, but say them slightly differently so I can get some credit for them too. Um, first, I would urge folks to focus on what might be called evidence-based regulation. So for example, if you had a regulation for barbers who cut hair, I don't get as many haircuts now that I'm older, but if you had a regulation that said you had to get a license to become a barber, does that actually result in a better quality haircut or simply higher prices? Same with providing eyeglasses to people. You, and people have done studies on that. If you find that kind of licensing doesn't actually help consumers, get rid of it. So, so one idea that I'd focus on and urge students to think about is empirically examining what's going on in the real world. The second point, which I think is equally important, and I learned uh, from one of my mentors in the White House, is uh, succinctly stated, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, um, and in particular, recognize that politics frequently impinges on decision making in democracies. So sure, from an economist's point of view, to switch over to climate change, it might be very nice if we had a global agreement and countries achieve that agreement in some cost minimizing manner. But that ain't gonna happen anytime soon. That relates to the question she Hannah asked you about. How do we get there from here for this new paradigm? So we need to start thinking outside the box and asking ourselves within the context of political constraints that we face in the real world, what can we do on some of these really big questions, whether it be dealing with financial stability and economic growth over time or climate change. So for example, if we can not come up with a serious agreement with 180 countries for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, maybe we can come up with a research and development policy that makes sense. Or maybe we can come up with a system of prizes or what have you. So I guess what I'm saying, uh, you know, I'm driven by talking to, I know some of you are professionals in the room, but I'm driven to talking to graduate students. There are real opportunities out there now. There are big problems that need to be addressed. There are Stiglitz level problems, but real problems, not theoretical problems. And you can bring your tools to bear on them. So that's my um, pitch for this morning. <clears throat> I would have one recommendation for uh, regulators and the second for supervisors. Uh, so uh, regulators who are responsible for writing the rules uh, should not forget that the more regulation, the more responsibility on the side of the authorities. And uh, regarding uh, supervisors who are responsible for the enforcement of the rules should not forget that they should not be involved in, in business. They don't... Uh, uh, they should not inter intervene in business. They are responsible primarily for the compliance. It means uh, to, to check whether the financial institutions uh, have uh, uh, appropriate risk procedures uh, internally. Thank you very much. I shouldn't be so, um, so cheap here and not letting you guys join the floor. So if any of you have any particular questions, please feel free. Go ahead and ask. Thank you. <clears throat> a two-part question to the panel, if I can. Uh, one general and the other specific. Uh, the general one, uh, is a principles-based system potentially better than a rules-based system? Or to put it another way, is the governor of the Bank of England's eyebrow more effective than the SEC rule book? Uh, and the specific question, um, was Sarbanes-Oxley an act of congressional catharsis provided a huge present to the City of London, and will Dodd-Frank and FATCA provide similar regulatory arbitrage opportunities? Thank you very much. Um, I wonder who wants to take that one in. I think that it's probably going to you, Bob. I have a feeling. Yeah, it's 
Uh, principles versus rules. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, take the, give you the weasel answer. I think both have the, the they, they both have their advantages in different settings. So you were talking about the head of the, of the Bank of England raising his eyebrow. I think that can matter, particularly given the relationships he has with, with banks, though I don't know him personally. Um, Rules-based stuff can matter in different settings, so I think they both have their day in court. Um, okay, Sarbach, Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, what was the question there? Is Dodd-Frank going to actually... So when you say, when I think of Sarbox, maybe I don't understand your question. Um, businesses in the United States complained a lot. Uh, so I mean, yeah, okay, go ahead. You already have legislation in place which allowed you to put the executive credit on in prison. Right. Okay. Putting a hugely costly SOX process over corporate America meant that companies gave up listing in New York and came to London. Ah, okay. Um, so I don't know the answer to it. So, so I agree with the... I, I agree with your claim, and uh, I don't know the answer for Dodd-Frank, um, but obviously to the extent it raises the cost of doing business in the U.S., things look attra more attractive in London. Um, well, let me add that, uh, well, question regarding principles and the rules. In fact, I love rules, uh, and I, I uh, uh, but it's not so easy to distinguish, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to see the difference between the rules and principles because when I say I love rules, I mean, for instance, that uh, our monetary policy was based on a simple rule. Uh, it's inflation targeting, or you can imagine a, a number of other rules for the monetary policy, but also for the fiscal policy. Then the question is how to enforce the rules in the fiscal policy, which is much more, much more difficult. But uh, then I'm speaking about that, I'm not sure whether we should call it uh, a rule or a principle. <laughs> so it's uh, perhaps the difference is not so, uh, not so clear. In, in my opinion, always there must be a certain uh, principle behind and then some relatively simple rules. Uh, and this is the, the, the aspect I mentioned that uh, everybody should know uh, the the playing field, uh, so something should be uh, should be uh, should be written. So some principle should reflect in the, uh, in, in in the rules. So uh, perhaps maybe I don't understand the question fully, but uh, it's a certain combination. And regarding FATCA and uh, this type of regulation, I see that it's extremely costly, extremely costly. So when I when I see the implementation cost on the side of financial companies. So you can see, moreover, you can see differences in individual countries because in some countries, uh, supervisors really insist on very detailed implementation and the financial institutions will pay enormous cost. Uh, in other countries, or so some financial institutions uh, uh, would go in, in the minimalistic way just to comply and not, not to overreact. Yeah, if you want to add to this. Just a very quick comment on, on the first question. I don't have comments on the second one. But on uh, rules, um, uh, principles-based approach or rules-based approach, I just wanted to share uh, the dilemma that uh, we have struggled with at the World Bank uh, on this issue. Um, we have been a rule-based institution for the last 60 plus years. Um, and what is happening today is a huge swing uh, to the other side. We are changing our entire rule book um, to become what we call a principles-based institution. And the reason for it was the complaint uh, coming from our member countries as well as many of our staff that we had too many rules. No one could understand them. I used to be chief counsel for policy of the World Bank and uh, I didn't know all the rules. People would come and say, you're the chief, you should know. I'm like, I don't know them. <laughs> there were just so many. Um, but um, this shift towards a principle-based approach is um, uh, we expect it to make the bank uh, more effective, more responsive, to give people more discretion and the like. At the same time, I should mention that in some quarters of the bank, some people are saying, you know, isn't it going too far, the principle-based approach that may have 
created some crises in some countries? You know, where do you find that appropriate balance? So the bottom line is it looks like we are experimenting and uh, it is really what we're gonna see in, in reality that would tell us whether what we had done in the past was the right thing or whether the new approach is the better one. Thanks. Well, I would like to ask uh, about uh, what type of uh, regulation or specifically how to uh, regulate the financial supermarkets, so-called, or large banking companies which uh, are a threat to the whole system if they lose their cash or if they have any problems. Thank you. Any takers on this one? Uh, well, I can only say that uh, this is one piece of uh, regulation I don't understand fully. I don't understand uh, why there is so big emphasis on systematically important institutions and why the attitude should be, should be different. Obviously, global institutions can influence the system, but uh, the rule should be the same for, for everybody. So, Naturally, I don't see, I don't, I, I don't need any specific rules for that. Obviously, <clears throat> with respect to this market, uh, where I have some experience, there are three, three or four big institutions, and it's quite natural that I would put uh, uh, more attention to these institutions rather than to institutions with one uh, percentage share in the market. But I don't think that the rules should be should be different. But the emphasis and the, the attention of the supervisors should be different. Thank you very much. Anybody else wants to comment on this? Oh, um, I'm not sure whether I think the rules should be different, but let me, uh, if in principle, we could actually measure the different impacts um, that firms might have on the stability of the system, you would want to charge them a different price for the potential damages they're imposing on the system. Now, I'm not saying that we can do that easily, but that could provide a rationale in principle for treating them differently. But I'm not sure if that's what you're saying or, or, or not. All I'm saying is if they impose a different level of damages or externality on the system, you want to charge them differently. Do you agree with that? Well, typically financial institutions contribute to some guarantee funds, but it's a certain share to uh, their uh, assets. Uh, so they contribute more in absolute terms, but not, not in relative terms. So they are bigger. They certainly deserve more attention, but uh, I'm doubtful about uh, different, uh, different rules. I think we agree. Very good. Then any other questions? Thank you. Um, I had a question. I, early on, there was a question in the panel, and I believe everybody on the panel said that they thought there would be more regulation in the future um, in respect to financial markets and the like. But I have a concern. Maybe it's a little early for the U.S. presidential election politics to be very prominent over here, but the uh, Republican field for candidates is closed. One of the people in the primaries is now going to be the one facing President Obama next year. And I don't think a single one of them would be in favor of more regulation. In fact, I believe all of them are in favor of closing the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, at least two of them have said they'd like to remove the independence of the Fed. So there's a big push, at least in the United States, to do a lot less regulation. Um, and I wonder how that plays into the concerns here and interaction over with Europe and the rest of the world. Thank you. Um. My response to that, and this is something I actually know a little bit about, uh, is embodied in the phrase, don't worry, be happy. The good news and the bad news in the United States is that the president doesn't make policy by himself or herself. There's something called the Congress, and that may or may not change, but that's something you want to look at closely with respect to the kind of regulations that you see coming out of, or laws at least, that you see coming out of Washington. And I'm happy to talk with you about this after the session if you'd like. Anybody else wants to add? Um, yeah, just, I, I would just say that it's, um, 
I will not limit the answer to the United States. I mean, there are so many countries around the world that are affected uh, by what is going on. But um, if you just look at the, the general reaction of um, policymakers when you have a crisis, um, if the cause is identified as a particular, linked to a particular set of facts, basically there is a tendency to swing to the other side, and that's what I was referring to earlier. So it is likely that, you know, since the public is pointing to government saying, you did not do your job, in order for government to show that they are going to do their job in the future, they might issue more regulations and tighten the screws until the next crisis. So, If I may add, it could also probably be one of the typical sort of way how politicians act one way before the election and then act a different way once they're elected. Um, there was another question on the floor. A specific question to Robert Hahn about the drug prohibition which has been in place in the Western world for well, way over 50 years. It had extremely very similar economic effects as the alcohol prohibition in the United States back then. You know, it's very expensive. Uh, uh, it led to gang wars. It had some, but rather limited success in bringing down consumption. So you know, the fraction of teenagers smoking pot is way over 30%, both in the US or here. And so what is then the fundamental difference between the drug prohibition and the alcohol prohibition that you know, keeps the drug prohibition in force while the alcohol prohibition was just so quickly dismantled uh, in the United States? I'm going to give you an off-the-cuff answer, and it, it requires a more serious response, but I just don't have time to think it through. Um, just speaking for myself personally and other people I know, when they think of drugs, particularly what I would call hard drugs, not marijuana, they know people who have had very difficult times or died associated with hard drugs. I, th I think that there is not a strong sentiment to have those drugs deregulated, notwithstanding the best arguments of economists of the kind you were making. So I, I think that while there's not a complete consensus that <coughs> these things should be um, banned, um, th there is a large fraction of the population, at least in the US, who believes that their consumption should be extremely limited and, and in some cases prohibited. But that's just my quick and dirty answer. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I was actually going to mention that because I do feel it's an interesting sort of um, part of the discussion, the focus on the economy. And <coughs> the drug issue is interesting because I think that a friend of mine just came back from the US and he went to a party in San Francisco and he was excited because everybody's walking around with the medical cards for marijuana. <laughs> um, you know, regular friends of his and students and suddenly it's, it's all around and, it's, and everybody's liking it. And, it's, and I do see it here in Europe as well. I think that the original strict policy towards marijuana, I'm talking about here only, is loosening, and we see that everywhere. But um, well, I think there's a serious debate in the U.S. as to whether California is is or is not part of the U.S. Of <laughs> <laughs> there's always been that one, um, but unfortunately, I think the time is running out. We've got two minutes left. Is there any other question anybody would wish to ask our panelists? No. Okay. Then I'll ask. Um, I think it would be nice to end this discussion on a very heavy topic um, with some positive momentum. And I would like each one of you to give us an example of how um, a one particular piece of regulation actually worked to the way that you would like it to be <laughs> functioning. <laughs> some paternity here, but I, I helped design what might be loosely called a regulation to curb acid rain in the United States by having a market in property rights for trading sulfur dioxide. And that worked, I will say, reasonably well. I don't have one that comes to mind like this. <laughs> as, as, as a good international bureaucrat, I have to study the matter and get back to you. <laughs> I hope that is 
because you have so many and you just can't <laughs> think of one. And not I didn't know say that. You know, some of the big favorites. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Stay here. And you mean uh, the financial regulation or regulation in general? Any? Any? Well, uh, <laughs> I will stick first to the financial regulation. Um, Thank you. Well, uh, it's, uh, uh, well, uh, this, despite some criticism to, you know, to that, uh, to that uh, recent response, uh, uh, the, the crisis also show that uh, uh, there is practically no government in the world who can dare to uh, fall down the whole financial system. So and it's, uh, it's more than uh, 100 years when the authorities uh, try to regulate uh, uh, the banking sector. So what, what I would like to say that uh, some parts of uh, the banking sector, some services uh, became uh, the crucial infrastructure of the modern economy so that uh, it's, it probably makes sense to regulate them and it makes sense that the, the government takes the responsibility because as we have seen there is at least the implicit responsibility so uh, that's probably fine and which piece of the regulation is probably reasonable to uh, <coughs> to ask uh, financial financial institutions to to maintain uh, some some capital the question is how calculate and how much but uh, some capital should be expected to be there <laughs> very good well, thank you very much all the sure, thank you very much um, my, audi uh, my audience, first of all, and then all three panelists, I think that what we've heard today is a mixed message. I think that we're about to face a world with more regulation, but if I'm going to take the optimistic route, hopefully it'll be regulation that's based uh, on the good principles that Hassan here has talked about, and hopefully we'll see some of the good examples that we've heard here being followed. Um, having said that, I also think that the world is full of people who do not always follow the rules and principles, so it's probably going to be a mixed bag, but it's always been like that. So with that, I leave you to go to other panels and get more educated on the matter so we can make the world a better place. Thank you.